first session is a little different in, in format. I'm Chris Bailey, and I'm, I have the honour to be chairing it. And we're going to do it as a kind of, if you, your memory goes back this far, Eamon Andrews, this is your life. <laughs> um, which means I'm, I'm Eamon Andrews. I'm not sure I'm so happy about that. And um, the purpose of this session is to have a conversation which will start on this side of the table, and then I hope include uh, all of you um, about the Leeds Arena. So it's This Is Your Life, Leeds Arena. Um, except that, of course, the Leeds Arena has perhaps not quite been born. Depends how you judge these things. But it has certainly, where the arena is at the moment, been the result of a lot of planning, uh, hard work, debate, discussion, argument. So um, there's already a lot to talk about. Um, but I suppose what I would, I'm really hoping will happen today is that something, maybe not the first draft of history, but something like the teasing out of some of the narrative strands that historians are used to, be, to dealing with, um, are the kinds of things that you'll hear from our three panellists. Um, our three panellists have had roles, very important roles, at each stage so far. So they, you are hearing it from the horse's mouth, as it were. Um, there's, there are others, but um, this will certainly get anybody looking back at the arena started, I feel confident. So we have uh, Jean Dent, um, who uh, was Director of City Development of Leeds City, at Leeds City Council for a long period of time, um, and whose memory of this particular project goes back to the first gleam in the eye 30 years ago. <coughs> Um, and those of you who've looked at this kind of development before will know that that is probably how long most of them take to come to fruition. Um, on Jean's left we have Martin Farrington, who has more recently been closest to the project in terms of, of managing it for the City Council as Director of City Development at Leeds City Council now. So um, he bears some of the scars. And um, he's probably also one of the people you go to if you wanted to find out 20 years, 30 years from now, where are the skeletons you say, Martin, where are the skeletons? <laughs> so Martin, I think, is somebody who's been very close to the project. A few years ago, the council, um, after talking to more than one partner, settled on SNG Europe as its partner to manage to run um, the Leeds Arena. And so I'm very pleased that we have John Knight with us this afternoon, who's a uh, uh, regional vice president, president, president for SNG Europe, and is based in Manchester, where he's responsible for the Arena of S. So um, here are our three witnesses, if you like, well, agents in making the arena what it is at the moment and will be. And I'm going to start off by asking Jean to say, um, and I posed a question in the little screen that I wrote about this, why has a city the size of Leeds um, not got, I think it was often put, an arena or a venue for top flight acts? And you can imagine perhaps that 30 years ago, the kinds of people people might have been thinking of do not come and play Leeds. So that was the way it was being put at that time. So Gene, if you could just say how you came into all this story and something about your part in that story, that would be great. Okay, uh, well, yes, I do go back a long time. I've worked at Leeds City Council for 40 years before I retired two years ago. And, uh, in the, and I'm a surveyor by background, so a lot of the work I did was in the field of regeneration of areas of the city, including the, the city centre, but some of the fringe areas. I got involved back in the late 80s when I was asked to go and buy some land that surrounded the Ellen Road Football Stadium. At that time, Leeds City Council owned the football stadium. It had bailed out the football club in the mid-80s when it was having one of its many crises. And uh, we looked to actually um, bring a range of activities together at Ellen Road. The arena wasn't absolutely conscious in the late 80s. It was the glimmer in the eye. Uh, there were one or two arenas being developed uh, in other cities in the country. And if you actually think back, uh, in, in terms of what Leeds was 30 years ago, it was coming out of that post-industrial period. It was trying to position itself. At that time, I think we called ourselves Capital of the North, which was very 
bold, bearing in mind Manchester, and uh, it, it probably said it was capital of the north too. But we recognised we had to be different, and to be different, we have to change the economy away from that industrial economy into a, a broad range of activities. But we also needed the cultural offer. And so there were a few mumbles around, why don't we bit have big cultural facilities? Now that gathered pace um, as we moved into the 1990s. And in the early 1990s, we actually um, put an advert out internationally um, to see if we could attract an arena developer and operator uh, to develop an arena at Ellen Road. And that actually produced very little at that time. It wasn't commercially viable then, it's not commercially viable now in terms of capital costs. I'm sure Martin may say a little more on that. Um, we then tried again in the early, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we actually um, came close to doing a development of an arena actually attached to the Ellen Road Stadium with what was then the owners of Leeds United Football Club. But again, because of the vagaries of football and what happened in football and there was a recession looming, then that all disappeared. But in between time, Leeds had transformed itself. It, uh, it had moved out of that uh, post-industrial period become a very vibrant city, had a very strong economy, um, a very, very diverse economy, and it also had a growing, broad cultural scene. Not just in music, but in dance, in visual arts, and so on. And so actually, uh, we got to the mid-2000s, and um, a lot of pressure around the fact why haven't Leeds got an arena, a conference venue, a concert hall, all of these facilities that were on offering places like Birmingham and Manchester. Leeds was as good as, as them in economy terms, but they weren't making that big statement about what they were as a city. So actually we then moved into having um, we appointed consultants who actually reviewed all the facilities that Leeds had and what it also needed. And what came top of the list, and this is in consultation with broad range of people in the city, including doing work with the Evening Post about what the public thought was, people wanted an arena. That was their absolute must. And what we recognized as a council was the importance, if we're going to make that sort of investment, recognizing there would have to be public sector funding going into that, they're still not commercially viable in capital terms, then it had to have a regenerative effect. And we look back to what we've done around that. And if you take something like Millennium Square, which I know a number of you will know is an outdoor event space. It actually has a massive undercroft with green rooms and technology rooms so that we can stage outdoor events on that. And there's actually one probably tonight or tomorrow night. We invested 10 million pounds in that square. Well, we in the uh, Millennium Lottery Fund 150 million pounds of private sector investment went into development that happened in and around that part of the civic quarter. And that happened and was triggered by that 10 million pounds investment. So we know that making a capital investment into something <coughs> substantial will bring in private sector funding. And I think at that point it would be good to hand over to Martin because he arrived to deal with it in the mid 2000s and, and has taken it on. And just at the point at which the consultants have been asked to look at these various cultural facilities and have come back and said, what Leeds wants is a, an arena. Yes. Okay. Martin? Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. I mean, in terms of my background, um, my actual background started in leisure management and then I moved into. Um, I was involved in the development of South Leeds Stadium, John Charles Stadium as it is now, the uh, South Leeds Tennis Centre. Um, I worked on the redevelopment of Headingley Cricket Ground around 1999, um, and I did the master plan for Ellen Road in about 2006, 2007. And also at that time, I led the sale of Leeds Bradford Airport. Um, so, my background was in a mixture of um, helping to deliver um, projects and transactions. Um, and Jean asked me to um, assist in terms of uh, the delivery of the Leeds Arena. And I think um, what was key there in picking up on what Jean is saying, was saying is that 
Leeds had failed at least twice on the delivery of an arena. And the important point that in a commercial market, left to its own devices, arenas don't make commercial sense. Um, I think I'm right in saying, John, actually, that the only arena in the UK that's really been delivered with private sector money alone is Newcastle, um, which um, is probably the, um, I don't know how best to describe this, but it's a shed. It's a shed. It's a big shed. It's a big shed. If you look at Sheffield, significant amount of public money on the back of the World Student Games. If you uh, look at Manchester, £33 million pounds as part of the 1996 Olympic bid from the government. Um, if you look at the O2 in London, um, a peppercorn rent of the Millennium Dome and all of that massive transport infrastructure as a, as a freebie. And then if you look at the Echo Arena in Liverpool, £165 million pound development with a conference centre. Every single element came from public funds, either English partnerships, European money, uh, the council's land, or regional development agency money. So, to run an arena, it needs the public sector to address the capital costs in some form. And the exercise that we went through was, what is the extent of that market failure, and therefore, what is the minimum intervention that the council needs to make to move us from no arena to <coughs> having an arena that works. And the feedback that we got was that the, that the right approach is to secure the operator first and to um, have a relationship with an operator where it's a commercial relationship um, of the development of the arena and the rent paid from the operator. Um, and what the council is doing is effectively facilitating that development and providing some gap funding. And we, we recognised that we needed to make um, an investment of up to £20 million to address that market failure. Um, and uh, one thing that was absolutely crystal clear to us is to understand our role. So we're not operating the arena, we're not micromanaging its design, we're not interfering with the operator's business plan. What we're doing is addressing that market failure and allowing an arena then to be developed and to thrive under the management of the operator. And what that means in practice is, and I suppose an example that's outside of the arena <coughs> is, is um, Stansted Airport. And you might think, what's, what's that about? But it was designed by um, Sir Norman Foster. If any of you have been to Stansted Airport, if you go again, it is a classic example of a building working as a machine. And it's designed to receive people at the front door, for them to be processed through the uh, mechanics of getting through um, up to the airplanes, and then onto the airplanes and being processed back through again. And the way in which the Leeds Arena has been developed, which I think is, is probably unique, in the way uh, arenas have been developed, certainly in the UK, uh, between the public and private sector, is that um, SMG, as the selected operator, provided a very detailed facility specification. It's their specification for how an arena operates. And what our job was, was to deliver that specification. And what that drives is a, um, an architectural response that is very much form following function. Because in an arena, you have the back of house and the um, uh, movement of equipment coming in and out and the need for that to be very efficient and promoters wanting to let that to be as efficient as possible and a quick turnaround, the accommodation for the artists and the interaction between that back of stage and the front of house and then the movement of people in the front of house into the uh, arena, vertical movement through the building, and for that to be as efficient as possible. And what SMG's specification <coughs> did was it mapped that out. But what it also did was it mapped it out in a very efficient way. So if you looked and critiqued other arenas in the UK where the public sector has developed them with the best of intentions, you may find that they're over-engineered because they're trying to be all things to all people and the tectonic scoreboards, the significant costs, ice floors maintained all the time with significant costs. 
in the later arena, that, th those elements aren't in there because the reason why they don't, they are, they're not in there is because they don't make business sense for SMG. And so what you end up with is a very efficient design solution um, and that's, I think, why we've been able to deliver that in the worst economic crisis in the last 50 years. Okay, thank you, Martin. And uh, John, I mentioned earlier on that uh, you came into this picture, um, uh, it was in 2008, I think, <coughs> or maybe a little before. Yeah, 2000, 2007. 2007. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, we got the gig in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, four years ago this month. Okay. That, uh, that we were chosen uh, as the operators, and and Martin has said, I mean, it's significant that um, uh, they didn't just come to us. I mean, there was a competition run by uh, by the, the city council, and every major venue operator in uh, in Europe was interested in putting their hat in the ring to run Leeds Arena. Um, commercially, that made sense. But also, there was this element that, that you've just referred to, which was um, innovative, certainly very refreshing from uh, arena developers to bring in an operator before the plans were, were drawn up. And quite often, SMG is, um, claims to be the world's biggest venue operator. Uh, American company basically means it's America's biggest venue operator. Over 200 accounts in, in the US, based in Philadelphia, 75 arenas, Major stadiums, places like Louisiana Superdome, uh, Soldier Field, etc., etc. Um, we are SMG Europe, creatively uh, entitled as the European arm, and we have uh, four arenas, including Leeds now, uh, in the UK. My role is across the UK arenas. Um, the Empire, such as it is, stretches as far as Poland. Uh, we have the Rocklaw Stadium, which some of you will see as one of the new venues for uh, 2012 European Soccer Championships this year, uh, and uh, the Aura Arena in Istanbul, also Oberhausen Arena Germany, plus certain theatres around. So um, we, we have a very well-established business with the biggest arena operator in the UK, with, uh, with uh, we'll be over 50,000 seats in our control when Leeds comes on, on board. Um, so quite often, Operators are given the venue. The venue is drawn up, it's built through, through whatever funding, public or, or whatever, and they say, who wants to run this? How much will you give us a year to do so? It's a commercial uh, operation. Um, but we go in and we, we take what we're given. With this, we've been able to design with the city council something that works for both ends. It works as, as you said, for, for, the, for the operators, the promoters, the artists, and for the audience. Um, and so that was a that was a, a refreshing challenge and something we were very interested in. Secondly, it has to work commercially, and you know, Leeds was probably one of the last two cities in this country uh, that we feel, as operators, could sustain a major arena venue. The way the economy is, this will probably be the last one to be built. Um, the other city, for those who are interested, would uh, be Bristol and the industry believes that as well. Uh, but there have been many false dawns there, not quite as many as Gene's 30 years. <laughs> and I didn't realize it was 30 years. That's putting real pressure on us now. It's got to be bloody good. Yeah, it's got to be good. Um, and, uh, but you know, Leeds and Bristol were probably the only two cities that could sustain it. And so um, you know, we have to make money out of it. And if we are successful and make that money in order to pay the council and others, then Leeds will be successful in terms of attracting world-class artists and the trickle effect of that, both economic and in a musical sense, will be significant. By the way, I can say that Newcastle is a big shed because it's one of our arenas. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't being rude about uh, somebody else. Thank you, John. And thank you very much, everybody, for that, that in, initial statement of how you got involved and what your part of the story has been um, so far. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to hear from from each of you in turn, in a way. Um, Jean, you've more recently been acting chief executive of, of marketing leads. Yeah. So I wonder if you could say something about the, um, the way marketing leads is thinking about the perception of leads as the result of having. 
Obviously, it's a major opportunity in terms of positioning the city, and we've already um, started speaking to SMG and working with Martin around how we start telling that story. Um, John describes it as being a year out from the opening, so I assume that's 12 months away. And what we need to do at, at different points, so for example, when the new management team is appointed for the arena, that's a, a good point around the story uh, around the arena. But then it gets much more interesting and exciting when we know when the opening day will be, who the headline acts are going to be, not just for the opening, but happening throughout that, that first 12 months. So enormous opportunity, not just about positioning uh, locally and regionally in terms of selling tickets, but actually positioning the city as the city which has the most state-of-the-art arena, probably in the world at that point, because it's the one that's finished at that point. We have to take that opportunity as a city and market it that nationally and internationally. And that's what we're determined to do. Um, and, and therefore, 2013 uh, and the arena and the opening of Trinity Leeds, interestingly, which I know is a, a big retail scheme, but it, it's more than that. It's going to have an every month theatre, <coughs> it's going to have lots of leisure activities. It's actually about saying what we have in 2013, despite the five years of recession we'll have been through by then, is a really strong, economically active city and city centre. And off the back of that, attract further investment and further employment into Leeds. That's what it's about. It's about um, giving Leeds that, that air of success, which we know, we, we're here, we know how successful it's been in the past and will be in the future. It's about using the arena as a strong brand for the city internationally, but it's also making sure off the back of that, that we actually bring more investment, more development and more jobs into the city. I think it's worth, sorry to interrupt yeah. there, Chris, I think it's worth noting um, and mentioning here that you know, what Leeds wanted and what has been provided, what is being built just over there now, um, isn't just another arena. And it may well have been if you'd got this away in the 90s, <coughs> the early two, 2000s. Yeah. Uh, a traditional arena, you've all been to them, it's, yeah. it's a sports hall. Yeah. The Manchester Arena, which is, um, has uh, created uh, a situation and reinvented itself a couple of times, but is now the number two venue in the world in terms of uh, entertainment tickets sold. Um, was built out of the, the Manchester Olympic bid. Wouldn't have been built for any other reason, there wasn't the money to do it. But it's a sports hall. And when you sit there for your whatever concert, you're looking at someone over there, and the act is over here, and you, you're sort of shifting in your seat a little bit to, to do that. And it's the same at the O2, and it's the same at Sheffield and all the other typical arenas, the Horseshoe Arena. What Leeds hasn't done, and what will help this, uh, this case for regeneration and putting yourselves very strongly on the international stage, uh, is not another Me Too arena. This is a very special uh, design. Every seat faces the stage. It is we started calling it a super theatre, but it doesn't go anywhere near to describing what it is. Um, it's almost a clam shape rather than, than um, uh, theatre shape. But every seat faces the stage. Every seat is a good seat. And there isn't any other venue in the UK which has been designed like this. Um, funnily enough, and it, and it will create real interest in, in the business. It will, in itself, be a, a problem as, as it, it's, uh, it, it's advantages or disadvantages. Some acts who come and want to play with a great big B stage or a huge thrust may not fit into that space very easily because it's very compact, it's very uh, It'll be a much more intimate uh, experience for performers to see 12 or 13,000 people closer. They may not like that. It'll be a much more uh, intimate experience for the public who, who go there uh, because the plans dictate that in a traditional horseshoe arena, you are further away. In this one, you will be 40 meters, the furthest away from uh, the, at the back of the top tier, will be 40 meters closer to the stage than Manchester Arena, which is significant uh, in terms of the customer experience. And we will only succeed, and the city will only exceed, in looking after its customers. And those are the customers who come in the back door, the performers, they have to enjoy it. 
and the customers who come in front of, and they're both interdependent. Yeah. Well, you make an excellent point. Those who have not already done so could look at the website for Leeds Arena and you'll see there is a, a video, um, an artist's impression if you like, of the way it will look. Uh, but you'll also find some photographs, a photo stream by somebody called Schofield, is that right? David Schofield. Yeah. David Schofield, yeah. who's taken some amazing pictures of the building in construction. Um, can, can, I mean, just bring that yeah. point to life. Um, if you take most arenas, a lot of them, the boxes, are the furthest from the stage. They're at the back of the auditorium. There's a bit of a, um, a paradox there, because you're paying the most for your seat, and you're at the back of the auditorium. And that's why, in terms of how the SMG specification for the leads are in, is to put them at mid-tier. So they're sort of optimum position in terms of looking down on the stage. And it's just that commercial focus to the design, I think, that comes through the leads are <coughs> Good, and, and uh, finally, from our side, we'll open it up to questions. I remember the ball team was very unwise and got some special beer mats printed with an opening date. And I, uh, I don't know, John, <laughs> at the moment it's about 2013. <laughs> well, um, I, I would like to give you an exclusive <laughs> here today, um, but I'm unable to do so because um, my mother always said, you can't rely on anything that has either a builder or a ball involved. Um, and clearly, builders are involved uh, very much in, in this. Um, the venue is on, on time virtually. Everything's looking very, very good, but we won't know from the builders uh, until six months out uh, when they're going to hand over a firm, firm date. But um, we are taking um, interesting bookings. Um, we will be opening next year with uh, with major acts. In fact, um, in between these sessions, uh, one of the one of the top and uh, most influential promoters in the country, uh, is Stuart Galbraith, is coming to look at the venue with me. Um, he's speaking to this uh, session later on. That's why I, I flatter him in, in such a way as saying he's <laughs> one of the most influential and experienced promoters in the country. Um, um, but you know, clearly there is there is major interest in. Yeah. in venue and uh, we will be attracting world class acts and it is absolutely correct that the experience that people have there is important but we must always remember it isn't paramount you go to gigs to see people you want to see on the stage and it's not all about the artists but it starts and ends with the artists you won't pay 45 pounds to go and see an act at Leeds Arena because the bars are good, you've got great facilities, and you can get in and out of there. You might you know, be a crossover, and we need those people to cross over because we can't just, and the industry cannot rely on the big, big fans, but it begins with the artists on stage, and that is something we should never really forget. Thanks very much, John. Now, we've heard from this side of the table some of the stories about Leeds Arena. Are there questions and comments? Yeah. Um, it's a question I think more for, for John. I was just thinking about the interaction between the design of the arena <coughs> sorry, and um, some of the marketing practices that perhaps are more traditional of, of arenas. And I was thinking about with the, the, um, the design of the seating and you were commenting that nobody's going to be further than 40 metres from the stage. What impact that might have on the traditional kind of pricing practices of structuring prices surrounding really distance from the stage and mm. whether or not those kind of practices will be challenged and how they might be different by an arena that's been designed specifically in uh, this way. I sometimes wish we had control over prices but the, the industry model is that the prices are set by the promoters and the venues, whether it be us or Wembley or whatever, doesn't have the say in, uh, in the cost of tickets. Uh, it's a strange business in, in some way, running a, an arena, because it's unlike probably almost any other business. You don't have control over the final product. Uh, you don't have control over what the artist is charging for a ticket price, what time they're going on stage. I can't knock on Beyonce's door and say, come on, look, there's 15,000 people, you're an hour late. <laughs> or Rihanna, it would be in that case, you're an hour late. <laughs> uh, you can't, you, you can't determine how good the final product is. 
although most of them are, and if they're not that good, then there's some technology that will, will help them. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to concentrate on the things that you can control, which is the welcome, the way your stewards interact, the way your staff interact, the fact that you can get a drink at the bar, and the fact that the seats are good. But in terms of pricing, that comes down to the promoter, and in some cases the artist. Uh, Stuart may talk about that a little, little later. Uh, the promoter has to buy the act. So the, the price of the tickets has to be set of what the act wants in order to make it commercially viable. So we have to concentrate, as I say, on the things that we have control over and, and hope, and by and large, that hope is realized, that the artist performs. Dave? I think most of the people who love music in my short shirt are really going to welcome the development of the arena. And if it's as good as you say it is, then uh, uh, and the promoters don't overcharge on the tickets, then going to be great and of course it's based in the city centre and you know with good public transport links that's that, 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 that's great too. But I have a question really about the development of it and about the thinking about music venues within Leeds City Council generally and really it's a question about how much thought is given to the musical ecology of the city as a whole. I mean this of course is you know, one of those big brand venues that uh, most cities of any size across Europe try to develop in order to bring in investment to it and so on. But a lot of the actual life, musical life of a city, cultural life, life generally in a city, depends on a whole network of musical experiences, not just the ones in these uh, big prominent venues. What, what, was there any thought about the relationship of the arena to you know all the other kinds of musical venues there are in Leeds and in West Yorkshire generally? Well, a part of the original study was to have a look at what cultural facilities actually existed in Leeds. And the, one of the strengths of Leeds at that time, which was mid 2000s, was certainly around that more local music scene. Uh, but also around things like the classical music offer in the city and the fact that we have a whole season of classical music based in the town hall and then there were issues about the quality of the acoustics in the town hall. So we did actually look at what was on offer already, uh, how that fulfilled the need to have a culturally rich city and that's really important. You look at any successful city in Europe and it's around having that really strong cultural mix so you can go to the local pub and get live music and at the other extreme you can either do classics at the town hall or, you know, Beyonce, that's your wish at, at an arena. Um, in terms of what uh, Leeds and Council was doing at that time, it did a lot of work, it still does, I'm sure Martin can confirm that. Um, at that grassroots level, working with communities, and it might be on local festivals, it's certainly on you know, activities like this activity, activity you know, like at Leeds for this, this weekend, staging its own music events, both small in parks, but also massive events in places like Temple Newsom. And it still has that commi commitment to that, making sure that music is accessible to as much as it can of the local community in Leeds, because actually, Regional and national visitors will look after themselves in terms of paying, whether it's to, to use the town hall for the alley or you know the, the arena for Beyonce or Celine Dion. So it recognises and supports clearly in this difficult economic climate. The council has had to make some really tough decisions that Martin obviously has had to lead on, but it still has that commitment. And we think having the sort of festivals that are happening this week having events that are music based across the city throughout the year are really important in terms of attracting people to visit Leeds but actually people make decisions about basing their businesses here because actually they want quality of life when they enter a city like this and that's why all of these offers are really important. Well I was going to say that um, if you look at the Leeds music offer I'll say at the very top end you have know, Rambe Park where if you look who's played at Round Day Park, it's Madonna, Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, 
U2, the Rolling Stones, and the last artist to play was Robbie Williams in 2007. Yeah. You have the uh, annual festival at um, Bram Park. Um, you have Party in the Park, which is a very sort of teen audience uh, <coughs> type uh, of event. You have Opera in the Park, and then you've got uh, the O2 Academy and the uh, events at the university. And so it goes on, and there's I think 6,500 people in Millennium Square tonight. But the area that the gap in that market was that arena venue that on a regular basis can attract top line acts. So that you know, if you're looking through the, the Guardian's guide on the Saturday, Leeds features, um, it's, it's part of that tour, and it's part of the city that has an aspiration to go up the league, um, but it's actually present in that marketplace, which we haven't been. Question or a comment? Um, <coughs> is the arena, I think you said it's going to be about 14, 15 pounds a year. That's it. 13 and a half. That's more. 13 and a half. I just I mean, you said it's a very strange business, but I agree with you. Do you calculate how many nights a year you have to be using it for it to be paid? We, we work on a business plan which uh, talks about um, people through the door over a year. Right, so it's the total number of people, so yeah. the total number of people. Yes. I was just wondering how flexible the space was for smaller events. Or it's it's got a very exciting lower tier. Right. Um, now, smaller in our business yeah, no, is yeah. is different to yeah. uh, to to uh, other smaller concert venues. But what when we talked about the other venues, um, Leeds also has to create its own USP if I can use marketing jargon. Um, and what it's got is. A lower tier, just above the corporate boxes that, uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, which will be, depending on final seating plans, around about six and a half to seven thousand theatre. Right. It will be uh, an intimate theatre for six thousand. Sounds bizarre, but, but uh, and there's nowhere else in the country, as far as I can see, indoors that, is, that will have that uh, in a, a modern venue. And that will allow, enable us to attract things other than the normal mainstream rock, pop, family kind of, of bigger shows that, uh, that the arenas have to do. Uh, for example, Jesus Christ Superstars going out as an arena sh show this year. Um, that would be ideal for that layout. Um, we're hoping we can attract longer runs rather than just the, the one nights of, uh, of a, a concert tour for musical theatre in that setting. Because people have to make more money nowadays. Uh, and so the 6,000 capacity will be economically very viable for them to take bigger productions on the road. And I, I think looking at it uh, now, it's really beginning to take shape. That is something which will be a, a USB for Leeds. I think it's also important in, the, in that point that it's actually not undermining other current venues and it doesn't have that size good. because, you know, if you, if you take the Grand Theatre and the Playhouse, they're around 1,500, 1,750 seats. If you take somewhere like here, the venue is 350. So what we will have with the arena is that opportunity to have a spread across the whole range of very small and intimate like the venue right through to the 13,500 without having those conflicts in between. Do you, commercially, it doesn't work to, to open an arena for 1,500. No, no, that's what I was thinking about, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I think it's about picking up on John's point about it's not a new to arena. It's a very distinctive mm -hmm. offer that sets leads apart. So I don't know, John, but in terms of um, comedy acts, more and more uh, playing arenas, but I think that fan-shaped theatre style, much more intimate, is a much more um, better audience layout for them to, them, them to play to. So it, it, it will be strong in terms of you know, that opportunity. Um, I had a question. Uh, just we talked a little bit just now about what sort of acts are intended you're hoping to put into the arena. But you know, when it's being used to its full capacity, 13 and a half, we'll be able to attract that size of an audience. And, uh, in the recording industry and definitely in the festival industry, there, there are obviously kind of tremors you know, uh, uh, of, of concern 
about, you know, okay, arena rock or, you know, headline festival acts work at the moment, but we're really wondering 10 years, 20 years down the road, you know, who in music is, you know, is going to be uh, attracting 13 and a half thousand people. I was, you, you mentioned comedy and musical theater, and, uh, but you mentioned also no ice, no sport. Um, so what sort of scope in terms of acts do you, do you see in the long term? Or is that something that, that you think is a legitimate concern? Um, or uh, just wondering your thoughts about it. 20 years old. Um, or 10. Not you know, a projection is hard. <coughs> you know. I hate to say it, but it's, it's not a legitimate concern of mine. Without <laughs> 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 uh, sounding controversial, but it, one direction is my forecast uh, for being around 20 years from now. Um, they're they're going to be huge. Uh, you know, the great thing about the business is that nobody knows. Um, and, you know, making those forecasts. Is, is great fun to say where are the, the Bruce Springsteens or the Rod Stewart, the Neil Diamonds in 20 years time. Um, and the industry is, is so much fun at times because things happen that you don't expect. And if people had told us in, in the business that uh, sort of five, six, eight years ago that uh, ballroom dancing would fill arenas, You'd have been left out of town, and strictly, uh, and strictly has been one of the, the biggest success stories. If someone had told us uh, five years ago that uh, that a comedian can sell over a million tickets in this country in an arena tour um, on his own with nothing else on the stage, you'd have been left out of town. And of course, Peter Kay did that uh, and has started by doing that. Yes, Eddie Izzard was, was doing some of it beforehand, but basically has started a whole new genre of comedians playing, playing arenas. Um, there's always something which, which surprises and, um, and comes out of, of the woodwork, if you like, uh, to replace the boy bands of 10 years ago, although Westlife is still around. And, and so it's, it's difficult, but, but I'm not saying we're going to have darts, yeah. but again, darts as an arena spectacle yeah. uh, is, is just something that's totally bizarre. The, there's a, it's very interesting <coughs> and creative business. People will come up with things to fill those spaces. We don't know what they are, but the space is flexible enough to, uh, to deal with almost all of those, but no ice. So you can take all seats out of that wall and no You can fit that in. Yeah. Um, anyway, the seats are on the floor, so they're flexible. They can come out, and, uh, and we have worked very hard on, on yeah. making a flexible space. To create for everything that's around now, Cirque du Soleil was in Manchester uh, recently for uh, for five successful nights. Will work perfectly well there. Will be the best venue in the country for a show like that, apart from their traditional home of uh, the Royal Albert Hall, which is very special for, for them. But that theatre style that this is will work very well for uh, for those sort of new acts. We're talking about how to train your dragon and walking with dinosaurs. You know. These sort of things which weren't around a few years ago. There will always be something to fill these spaces in a cultural sense. It raises some interesting questions about not only the artists but also the promoters um, and whether pr promoters are creating enough to fill the, the kind of gap you're talking about. But um, I was just thinking about. Um, um, we were having this, this morning's discussion was about what makes menus successful. And obviously we were looking backwards at the time and we're talking about the Glasgow Apollo, five, um, hearing the part of its success was its grottiness, and the other was the bullshitness of the audience, um, and so on. The fact that it wasn't a very precious venue was one answer to that. Um, uh, Nathan gave us a, an account of Broodmore Social Club, which has been around a long time, as a, as a music venue as well as a venue. Um, and a lot of those things are very hard to quantify. In this audience, there's people whose academic life is partly about measuring and quantifying. So it is an opportunity just for us to talk about measures of success and, and those that you, you might see as being important. What would you want historians, sociologists, people who study music and popular culture to be doing that might help to judge the long-term success of, uh, of the Leeds Arena? Jean? 
Gosh, that's a very profound question. <laughs> There's always one. We thought we'd go away. Yeah, we were nearly there, love. I mean, for, for me, I, I love going to live music, so part of it is about making sure that Leeds is recognised internationally as somewhere to go to for a really great, strong, quality music scene. Mm -hmm. And then with my physical regeneration hat on, that actually, that it really helps regenerate that northern part of the city, which is, you know, a strange juxtaposition of wealth of the city centre and, and very high levels of deprivation close by. And we all <coughs> know that regeneration effect is happening. Before the place is even open, hotels are being developed around it, and owners of existing property are looking at how they regenerate. So, you know, it's that twofold thing. Our, our reputation, our recognition, but it actually really on the ground regenerates that area and creates jobs for those local people so that they can share in that, that wealth of what's happening in that part of the city centre. Martin? Um, I think for me it's that Leeds Arena develops its own distinctiveness and commands its own space in terms of the music industry as as something that has a degree of uniqueness about it that, that people sort of value. Um, and then on the development side, I mean, I was I was I was very interested and uh, encouraged when I, I a couple of years ago I got a phone call from Copenhagen uh, because they are, they're in the process of delivering an arena, and when you look at the approach they're adopting, um, they're using the Leeds model, and from a city perspective and Leeds being a city uh, in Europe that's going up a league, it's good to have cities like Copenhagen asking you how you did it. Uh, I think that's where Leeds wants to be. Yeah. That's very interesting. Tom, so, I think well, you'll be in retirement by the time we're looking back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a groundbreaking element of, of the shape and, and just, just changing the arena model uh, will be uh, something which we can hopefully all look back on and say that was, that was a wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will mean that some of the uh, artists uh, have to change if they want to perform there and, and sell tickets. And it is all about selling tickets. If they don't sell the tickets, they won't come back. Doesn't matter how, you know, it's all, you know, it's, it's called show business. Uh, and that's very much what, what it is. And uh, just changing that, that model and from SNG's point of view, using our expertise, our, our experience, our leverage in the industry uh, to get people to come and try the venue, and I'm sure once they have done, then it will change their experience from an artist and artistic point of view as well. Um, and I just hope that uh, when we do look back, we haven't let Jean and Martin down, or the people of Leeds, because uh, we know that everyone's waited a long, long time, whether it's 30, 20, or 10 years, for this venue to be built. And we realise that we, we have a big responsibility as venue operators uh, to make it work and make it something that people are proud of. Thank you. Any final points? Yes. Alison. Um, it was perhaps most nice to talk to the team. Um, I'm interested in regeneration around new music venues as well. And um, one of the, the narratives that seems to come out in literature is about kind of the displacement of people perhaps up in, in areas as they're being regenerated. Well, not even necessarily displacement, but people maybe being priced out of areas as the as the as the regen as regeneration takes hold and um, property prices rise and this kind of thing. I was wondering how you measure we talk about how you measure success, how you measure a sense of ownership of local people for these new venues. How do you generate warmth? Um, I was reading an article about Leeds' regeneration in which the Millennium Square is referred to as the posh square. I think there's could be kind of I think part of the way people claim these spaces is by uh, name and giving them these nicknames. So Carlo Clyde Auditorium is the Armadillo and the, the Clyde Arc is the Squinty Bridge and things like this yeah. and these kind of landmarks. Um, but there's almost this kind of it's almost a love hate that so you, you get these kind of it can really split like an opinion. Mm. And I was just wondering if you have any opinions on this kind of sometimes called urban pioneering, I guess, going into areas that, that are perhaps quite deprived and and it, and it is very difficult, I have to say. Um, and if you look at the, the area nearest to this, 
Um, uh, it's an area where there's quite a transient population, there's tower blocks, you know, so you have all the people coming and going. Um, they don't have that sense of community or a sense of belonging. That doesn't mean to say <coughs> that we can work hard with them to then feel part of that regeneration of that area, not just about the arena, but what's happening around. And the way that we try to do that in particular is to work with the operators or the owners of, of those schemes to actually work with local people and get them into an employment. And, and that often is one of the strong ways of actually getting their ownership. But we did, one of the first pioneering things we did around that, again, it was about um, 15 years ago, um, probably a little longer, um, was a, a Tesco, would you believe? And, and I mean, they do it regularly now, but at this point, Tesco have not nationally worked in doing a scheme adjoining a, a very large public sector housing estate where there was high levels of unemployment, and we required them to actually employ and train local unemployed people. And it was so successful that it's a model that we use in the city regularly, and, it, and it's part of the contract that we have with SMG about that local employment. At the same time, the council is also investing substantial sums of money in that council estate. And part of the work that Martin and the team have been doing is how you then physically connect people who live there back into the city centre. So it'll be walking routes, cycling routes, safe areas, improving the open spaces as well. So it's it's the physical and economic connections that are really important. Good. And on that note, I think we'd better wrap this session up. Um, can I just thank our three panelists for the the generosity with which they've spoken about the project and inspired us, I'm sure. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you.